Uh, I, last service, I didn't do it, and I should have done it, and I need to start with prayer, because when you talk about this particular topic that I'm about to talk about, you really need to cover it in prayer. So let, let's, let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. God, we thank you, Lord, that each one of us in this room, Lord, that we have ears to hear and eyes to see. God, that we have discernment of understanding what next best step we need to take. God, I thank you, Lord, that we are in right standing with you. Lord, I thank you that we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And Lord, that we are in right standing, Lord, to be able to to become instruments for noble purpose, Lord, to operate in discernment, Lord, to understand spiritual warfare, and Lord, to, to extinguish every fiery dart that the enemy wants to throw at us. So God, I thank you right now, Lord, that we are not susceptible to the, the, the enemy's uh, schemes. God, I thank you, Lord, that you separate us from this world. And so God, we give you honor and we praise you in this house, Lord. You are welcomed in this place, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. So I, I, I want to refrain uh, from preaching at you this morning in a way that may come across uh, as if um, if you're not doing these things, then you're bad, or, or you're not doing enough as a Christian, or, or whatever. So I, I want to, I think I'm reflecting on my sermon from this last one, um, and the reason why I'm doing that is because I don't want anyone to walk out of here today uh, thinking like, you're not perfect enough, or you know, you've allowed the enemy's schemes to get a hold of you, or, or, and you're failing as a Christian. So I, I want to dial back a little bit. Not that I was some hellfire damnation preacher this last sermon, uh, but but I, or last service, but I, I want to dial it back some to have a conversation with you about spiritual warfare, okay? Uh, as, when I grew up in church, my parents did a fantastic job raising me in church, all those good things. Uh, there were some moments where it's kind of like, why am I at church? And, and as parents, we always want the best, and we believe that, you know, we're, we're doing our very best. And, and knowing in, in my, own, my own parents and uh, how well they did. I obviously, I want to jump off the foundation that they set for me and do even a greater and, and, and an even uh, better job with my own children. Now, I'm not perfect by any way, shape, or form, but I remember going to church and thinking that church was the place where I built forts with the hymnals and where I hung out with my best friend, Wally. And that's where I, you know, that's, that's basically my, my gist of what church is. But church is more than that. Church is a, a training ground for us in the spiritual warfare and the battle. And knowing what God's word says and applying it and going out and doing it and being doers of his word. All right. So understand that that's what we're doing. And in, in that, there's all sorts of different facets that add to that. We're, we're a community. We're a family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Um, we need to be here for one another. All of those things play a role. So there's, there's so many intricate details that layer on what church is. So a lot of people come in. You may have come in here this morning with a totally different picture. Uh, church, by the way, there's no blueprint to church either. There really isn't. Some people are like, oh, there's a blueprint. And uh, if there was a, if, I've seen blueprinted churches. And let me tell you something, there better be a tongue and interpretation coming. Right, I knew I'd get you Baptists on that one. But it's the truth, all right? So that's where you, heed to my warning of the blueprint of what you think church should be about and, and realize, hey, we're all figuring this out together. Okay. Now, what I'm, what I'm getting to is, is when we deal with spiritual warfare, you need to recognize that there really is an enemy afoot, and the enemy is wanting to kill, steal, and destroy. And we need to be wiser. Okay. And the Word of God gives us everything we need to be wiser. All right? So the first thing I need everyone to start with is you need to realize 100% that God wants you to succeed. Too often people have the notion that God doesn't want us to succeed, that somehow he is fighting against us, that when we gain a ground or two or a foot uh, you know, up the hill, it's like, ah, there's a better lesson I got to teach them, and pow, right in the face, and you're like, oh, he's trying to teach me something. <laughs> it's like, no, no. 
God's trying to guide you through something. God is showing you what's happening in this fallen state world, and he's helping you through the process, okay? So God is with you. He's for you. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be fruitful in everything you put your hands to. He wants you to recognize that you have him to call upon. He wants you to recognize that you're, you're not alone. You're not alone, He wants you to be successful. He wants you to succeed. You've got to know this to be true. That helps your perspective of the Bible because the Bible, when you see it in that that viewpoint, in those goggles, that this is a love story for his children, that he loves you, that he's for you. And so when you go through troubles, it's not for you to, to run away from God. It's for you to run to him. The enemy, through spiritual warfare, wants to separate you. He wants to isolate you. He wants to call you out and, 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 and show you all the kinks in your armor. He wants, to, he wants to give you every reason why you shouldn't be doing what you're called to do. I, I, as a pastor, I get reminded on a daily basis that I don't, I don't need to be up here. In those moments, it's like, uh, I'm not that great. I, I, and, and actually, in those moments, actually, I feel... More qualified, actually, because I realize it's not by my strength, it's by his strength. There's a pride moment that goes, I pluck out of my brain as if, oh, I got to be in perfect order. And and that's where you realize, you go, God, you're in charge. You do these things. God, I'm just a vessel. And I get out of the way and let him move in. So so that's what I want to start this foundation with, because obviously, you know, we're in a family series right now. And today, I want to talk about spiritual warfare and how to train our children through spiritual warfare. Now, some of you go, well, I don't have children, or I have children that have already, I'm an empty nester, they're gone. Okay, and some of you in this room, you are children. And because I see it in your faces, I see some young, <laughs> young ones, my own children themselves. But don't take this as if it's only to teach little ones. T- take this as this is maturity and a, an image. It's taking what's immature in our own brains and to say, Lord, mature me. So you can take this and learn yourself. You can take this and learn how to teach others. You can take this and learn how to teach your family and your children and be more aware of spiritual warfare. So don't just cut off and go, eh, you know, this isn't really for me. This is for all of us. And I'm going to tell you right now, the reason why I wanted to start this off with prayer is because I know for a fact that this is one of the biggest topics the enemy does not want us to talk about. He will find any way, shape, or form to take this message and and, and pervert it, to distort it in our own brains because of what spiritual warfare does. Spiritual warfare, some of us think about this as like demon possession, Demon possession's real. I've been around it. I've seen it. I've, I've, I've been in other countries where I've seen it rampant. And then, then this notion of like spiritual warfare is demon possession is like to the extreme case, okay? Then there's, then there's a demon oppression which takes place, that there is oppression all around you constantly, and you need to do something about it. And that's why the Word of God tells us about the, the, the importance of putting on the armor of God. And, and I'll go deeper into that in just a second. But you can't look at the devil and think, oh, he's the opposite of God. So God being all-powerful, well, he's all-powerful here on this earth. The devil is not all powerful. The devil, the, what the devil has that we don't have and the advantage he has is time. He has time. Now, we obviously have more advantage of time because we get to live in eternity here soon, okay? But in the present moment where the enemy has had a, a, a and I don't even want to use the word victory because he has no victory, but where he has gotten a foot is time. He has sown things in to the fabric of time where it's behaviors. It's small compromises to what we as humans would want as success, 
to opportunity. He brings compromise into those things by sin. And what it does is it closes the door of opportunities. It closes the, uh, the, the success level of what God wants for us because sin comes in and it corrupts, it kills, it steals, it destroys. James actually goes on to talk about this, how sin operates. That God's not tempting you by sin, all right? He doesn't test you with sin. So get that right out of your head very fast because James actually destroys that theology. All right, sin comes in through temptation, and then as you allow it to breed contempt into your own life, it brings death, all right? So you need to be real careful of how you, you label sin. But it's through a behavior that through compromise, where you allow it to infiltrate into you the way you believe, into truth. You don't believe the whole Word of God. You only believe certain portions of the Word of God. You treat it like a salad bar religion. I like this. I like that. And then you just dismiss everything. You need to realize that this entire Bible... I believe, I know some people want to start up the whole fight about how, well, this was in 1619, you know, 1611, uh, they brought a, a council together of men. And the men, they took and plucked and they decided what books went into this particular Bible. And I know all of those stories, all right? I know the historical facts of it all. I need you to understand. I've got to stand on something, and i got to believe that my God is powerful enough to make sure that this thing is orchestrated perfectly, all right? So I'm going to believe right now that this is the Bible, that it is true from front to back, from Genesis to Revelation. I believe right now that all of the crazy, wonderful stories that are in here are true. I believe that Noah built a giant big ark, and he did take a bunch of animals on there with him, all right? I believe that Samson tied torches to the fox's tails and sent them through the fields. How that happened, I have no idea. I believe that David slew a giant, a big giant. I almost called him a giant giant. But I believe that he slew a big giant, all right? I believe that Jesus walked on water. I believe he healed everyone he came in contact with. And I believe that Jesus is still healing you today and that Jesus is going to return, all right? Period. All right. Now, with that foundation, <laughs> that the word of God is real, what I believe is, is that the enemy comes in and he just, twists it just a little, just distorts just enough to make you compromise. I teach this to my children often with spiritual warfare. I don't go into their bedrooms and sit down with them or we have a family moment. And at any time you kids feel like I'm not saying what's right, by all means, speak up right here in this moment. All right. Because I don't want to become a liar <laughs> to you guys. I want my children to be a testimony to this. All right. But I'm not perfect. But anytime we sit down together, I look at my children and I go, hey, if you allow sin, compromise, to come into the truth of what God's word says, you are closing. For one compromise, you're closing 10 doors of opportunity. And you can't allow this to happen. That's why it's important that we cover ourselves in prayer. That's why it's important that every single day we seize it. As this is the day that the Lord has made and I shall rejoice. And I want to do exactly what this word says to every, every obstacle that comes my way. Because I don't want an opportunity to be seized away from me. All right? So I teach my children this all the time. And we do this on every layer of life where it comes to schoolwork, friendships, uh, to even how they treat each other, to how they treat me and their mother. So all of these are, are just talked about constantly, layer upon layer, of we cannot allow compromise to come in. We must examine ourselves with the Word of God always. Are we giving God the glory or are we getting the glory? All right, we ask that all the time in our house, okay? Now, that brings me to the Word of God. His ways are higher, far higher than mine, so I want to know what he has to say, and there's a reason why. And it's found in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 27. It says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil." This scripture sums it all up. I believe this is the Father's heart for every one of us. I believe he's the creator. 
I believe he created the universe. And yes, I'm a creationist, meaning I believe that he created it in seven days, all right? I'm not going to tarry from that. I believe it. I've seen too much where I go, hmm, that's interesting. I was hiking a long time ago in California, and there's these bristol cone pine forests. It's one of the coolest places you'll ever visit in your life. And it's the oldest trees in the world, and it's located in California on top of this mountain, this random mountain. What's really crazy is, as you're walking through there, they've got trees, and they, got, they actually call this one tree the Methuselah tree, and it's the Methuselah Grove. And as you walk through there, they're telling you, this tree is the oldest, and it's like 4,000 and some years old, and they, how do you tell how old a tree is? Well, you core it out, and you count how many rings. Well, there's so many rings, because it's 4,000 some years old, they actually have to microscopic look into it and count the rings. That's how tightly knit they are. Well, what's really wild is as you walk around, they're like, there's trees and they're on the ground. And now these are petrified trees that are laying on the ground. They've been there, laying there for so old. And they're able to test those as well. And, and those trees that are down there are actually the age of what the creationists believe to be the age of the universe, which is when God said, let there be light and there was light. So it's interesting because if you think about it, the ones that are laying on the ground are the ones that God spoke from his mouth. That's like the Adam and the Eves. And the ones that are standing and still alive are like your Cain's and your Abel's. It's insane. I'm like walking around just touching every tree like, this is so awesome. This came out of God's mouth. You know, and I'm like, this is amazing. The reason why I tell you all this is because I'm not going to allow compromise. I know what the Word of God says is true. I'm not going to get stuck on humanistic theology or teaching. I want to stay true to what God's Word says. It helps me to see the bigger picture. So it doesn't cause me to go, maybe God's wrong. Maybe this Bible's not 100% accurate. i got to believe it i got to believe that it's true, 100%. So, therefore, I want to model that before my own children. Modeling the way that we live out our truth is so important. It's the most important factor of influence. Our children take note of all of this, and not only our children, but the people around us. You have to be aware of that. We've got to show courage when it's the right thing to do. We have to stand up for the right the right truth that God has for us. Now, it's important. I'm not going to step on anyone's toes this morning. I don't want you guys to come across as if I'm some like, uh, again, my way or the highway, or this is how I do it. You should do it this way. I, I, even though I just use the example of modeling what you, how you, you know, operate through the word of God, which is important because obviously Paul says, do as I do. <whistles> Talk about tough. Could you imagine I mean, that's a huge statement, heavy. I mean, that's a heavy, responsible statement to say, do as I do. Whew, man. But that does help to put in perspective the need to follow this to the fullest potential. But what I'm about to say is hard because parents, all of you are at different levels of of parenting, whether it be helicopter extreme, like you're hovering, or it's the, like, I don't care what they do, let them go out, you know, there's those extremes, and I know if I come in and try to tell you how to parent your children, you kind of get defensive real quick, so I ask you to take down the barriers a little bit right now, as I say, we need to be careful of what we're allowing to babysit our children. There's a lot of tablet usage, and don't get me wrong, my children have used tablets, all right, I've seen it, they have it, it's wonderful, I mean, it is. You're sitting at a restaurant and you're like, shut up, kid. Here's an iPad. Right? I get it. But that doesn't mean that that's the correct way to babysit our child. Okay? So in that, there are things that happen. The influences start infiltrating and we have to be so careful because, again... It's not like a blatant open sin that you see it. It's not like all of a sudden, kapow, they're completely different. You're like, who is this kid? They're possessed with the devil. You know, it's small behaviors. It's little things that lead them off of the path that God has chosen for you. It's a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. And that's what we need to be aware of. We have to pay attention to these things. So as parents... We all want to raise children that can stand firm against this evil and, against, and, and to stand strong against the deceptions and temptations of Satan. 
So it starts every single day with asking, hey, what's God speaking to you about? If they look at you and they go, mm, nothing, then you ask, what's the devil speaking to you about? Now, I wouldn't phrase it like that, all right, because <laughs> then I don't want them to think that, like, the devil's talking to them, because that's not true, all right? It's, again, what he has woven into the fabric of time, the, the deception and what people are believing, that if you're not being used as an instrument of noble purpose in the kingdom of God, then you're probably being used as an instrument for Satan in the earthly kingdom, and we have to be careful of this. We need to be more aware of it. So as parents, we should want to raise our children to stand firm against this evil. So we need to talk to them about it. Now, it needs to be age appropriate. And there needs to be some sensitivity with it. We're not out here to scare our children. We're out here to raise them so that they know and discern from right and wrong. Okay? Now, we've got to teach them about spiritual warfare. Period. Do not, you're not going to fight me on this one. I am going to be a little harsh on you. You have got to talk to them about spiritual warfare. If you don't, then they're going to think about how Larry's just a mean old person, you know, or or, or Brian, you're just awful. You're mean too. And, And then they don't realize, by the way, these are two of the nicest people on the planet, and that's why I'm using them as an example. But it's the notion of, of they're evil. They're not evil. Satan is evil. They unfortunately have been blinded by the tactics of the enemy, and they're just influenced by that, so they're replicating it. They need to be made aware of these things, and that's why it's important as us, as disciples of Christ, as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, we're bringing people to an awareness to open their eyes, to take the scales off their eyes so they can see. And it's so important. So don't we, we can't allow our children to just think there's just bad people and good people. No, there are people. And the people have a choice. And we have to teach them our own selves, our own children. We have to teach them that this is a choice for us to live for God and to stand firm and strong against the attacks of the enemy. So we've got to articulate that the battle is real. Clearly articulate that Satan's attacks, they take so many different forms. It's temptation, maybe to cheat in school. We talk to them about this. You talk about the struggles over sexual compromise, opportunities to resist or engage in bullying, confrontations with humanistic teaching, and, or maybe the internal battle with depression and self-worth. You describe all that the enemy is trying to do, and then you begin to attack it through the word of God. It's really important. Some of these basic teachings that we can bring before our own children is prayer and scripture. Teach them how to pray. Read in front of them. Pray in front of them. Encourage them to pray in front of you. All right? Understanding good and evil. Paint it out. A clear picture of what good and evil looks like. The armor of God. You must teach your children about the armor of God. you got to teach them discernment. The demonstration of love and compassion. Every single day. Love and compassion. you got to teach them how to guard their minds. You need to teach about open communication about spiritual warfare, that they can come to you and talk to you about it, that there is a freedom of thought that you bring in and you harness it and you rein it in to this, to the word of God, all right? But you allow them to ask questions. Don't make them feel stupid. Like bring, bring it up and be like, hey, what's going on? What are you thinking? What are you talking about? Let them discuss and let them talk, all right? And then for me personally, lastly, is that you've got to model spiritual battle tactics. So for myself, my children, they can see when I'm not happy in the house, something's going on. So I'll talk to them. They'll say, Dad, you okay? I'll be like, yeah, something's going on. And sometimes I'll share. I don't have to give them the whole detail, but I can tell them, hey, just something I'm struggling through right now. But you know what? I am praying that I get the victory, that God has already gotten the victory, and I begin to pray it out in front of them. I discuss those things that I'm doing, and they'll see that, that I get the victory, that I'm not defeated, and that I I don't succumb to the enemy's tactics of being isolated, or, 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 you know, find myself in my, in my closet upstairs sad and, and, you know, having a pity party. 
But no, I'm down in front of the family. I don't go hide. I get in front of my children. I live life out. I let them see the spiritual tactics that I'm, that I'm taking in the battle against these schemes of the enemy. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, we see all about the armor of God. Now, I'm going to read a few scriptures, and then I'll skip down. But in, in verse 10 of Ephesians 6, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. This is so easy for you to teach to your children. This is a, I mean, a huge, important, valuable lesson for them to hold on to. That in order to fight against the devil's schemes, you have to put on the full armor of God. What is the full armor of God? In verse 14, it says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So you buckle that belt of truth, all right? That truth guards you. That truth is what you st- keeps you there, where you realize, okay, I, I, I want to know what the Word of God says about every aspect of my life. And I, I, don't, I don't depart from that. It is in. I, it's on. I'm, I'm not taking it off. You teach your children that this is the number one thing that they can put on, because it's the first thing they should put on. The truth. The next is the breastplate of righteousness. Then the gospel uh, shoes of peace. And then you see the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. As you begin to discuss this, you begin to bring this into their lives on a daily basis. If they say, hey, this happened at school today. And you go, oh, you bring into a lesson into this with them. You talk about the breastplate of righteousness. You know that you can stand firm and bold, that you don't have to cower behind you know, the, the powers of the enemy. You can stand firm, bold, stand for what's right. As a kid, uh, my mom taught me this often. She would teach me about spiritual warfare. My mom was a little scary about it, though. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so, meaning there was definitely like this more demonic, like, presence of things. And I was like, Aah! and I'm scared about it for sure. I think what it was, it was that 80s kid thing for sure. Because, you know, that was pretty rampant uh, as it was, you know, anyway, I can't, I'm going off on a tangent. But I, I remember specifically mom going, if there's ever a Ouija board, you run. <laughs> and so that was absolutely mom. So I, I remember going to friends' houses where out of nowhere things would start taking place and I would get that discernment of I don't need to be here. And so I remember in elementary school being at one particular house where I got that feeling, and it was late at night, and I go, mm, I need to get out. So I called my mom, and it was late at night, and I was like, hey, I need you to come. Guys, there's a boldness with that, and I'm not taking a pride step. This is actually my parents instilling this in me of like, hey, you in trouble? You make the phone call. It doesn't matter what time it is. Get out of the house. So even though it was slightly embarrassing, what was really strange was the same kid Years later, in middle school, I go to stay the night with, again, it was a group of us guys, and again, around 11.30 at night, I go, uh, I need to get out of here. Like, there was just something about what they were doing, how, how they were in, interacting, and I thought, I don't belong here. And I praise the Lord that my parents taught me that discernment, because again, I wasn't going to compromise to hurt the opportunities that God had before me. I didn't want that in my life. So it's important that you teach your children about spiritual warfare, and you do it on a daily basis. You teach them about what the importance is of having that sword and that, and that shield and that helmet of salvation, that it protects you, if knowing who you are. In Christ Jesus, that you're not susceptible to the, the schemes of the enemy that they, they filter in your head and your thoughts and you start compromising. And you go, well, you know, I think that this is actually true. Or I think that God does this. I think you get a, better, better be really careful. <laughs> this is what I think. You sound like Job's friends when you start thinking the way you, you know how God thinks. Like that's, that's some thin ice you got to be really careful. And, and, and people fall into this often. So I think there's three things that we need to be teaching our children about spiritual warfare or how to attack spiritual warfare. The first thing I want to bring up is 
It's in Matthew, and it's a great story. Jesus goes out into uh, the wilderness, and he's tempted. And when he's out there being tempted in Matthew chapter 4, there's, there's one way that he fights the enemy every single time, and he says the words, it is written. It is written. He just says it over and over again. It is written. It is written. It is written. I, I want my children that anything that comes at them, that they will say, but it is written. I want them to memorize this statement. I want them to know that I have got to go to the Word of God for everything that's happening. If you have a mean coworker, you go to the Word of God. If you have a mean family member that just knows how to push your buttons, you go to the Word of God. All right. If you have something that's going on in your life financially, you go to the Word of God. If you need a breakthrough, from some type of an addiction, you go to the Word of God and you don't stop. Too many people just stop right there on the cusp. They, they get there and they're like, ah, they treat this kind of like a hocus pocus thing. This is a way of living. This is a full commitment, not just certain areas of my life, but my entire life, my whole life. I want to examine the Word of God in my whole life. It's so important. So I want my children to walk in a stature of it is written. I want them to stand up and get, it is written. When the enemy comes, it is written. I don't even, I, I, I don't want them to give any type of notion. Well, maybe, no, it is written. It is written. When you teach this, you show them that the word of God is truth. You're teaching them that it's not on your power, it's on God's power. You're teaching them that it is written is by God, not by you. Not by my strength, his strength. That's what you're teaching them. So when they ca have those heavy moments, they sit there and they go, I don't, even, I don't even know what to do. But it is written. It is written that my God is for me who could be against me. It is written that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. It is written that he, he has fought the battle and that I am fighting the good fight of faith, the battle of faith. And in that, I'm going to run my race and I'm going to be victorious. I'm not defeated. He defeated the grave. I'm alive and well. And I know what the word of God says. The next thing we have to teach our children is to renew their minds. We have to renew our minds every single day. This isn't something we just do partially, sometimes. We need all of us, and I'm, I'm a student of this right now, renewing our minds. Guys, we talked about it earlier. There is so much that goes on in our brains. The statistics right now are insane. Some of these statistics that we see or read or, or, or hear, they're, I mean, it's nuts. I, I thought the one statistic that blows my mind more than any other is that the man who lived in 1850, all right? So a man who lived in 1850, or even a woman who lived in 1850, okay, but we'll use the man as the example. Well, <laughs> We see, men, we see more girls in one day than they would see in an entire lifetime. So the statistic of this, so think about, so think about a man in 1850 and the statistic that they're, they're going to see maybe what? Like 50 girls in their lifetime of where, if they were out west or wherever they were. We see in an entire day what they would see in an entire lifetime. But not only are 50 a, a minuscule number, if you get on your phone, you're seeing ads and all of these different things that are happening, the YouTube videos, and then you got the television. You're seeing a thousand plus people in a day. You're seeing more than they're seeing. These statistics just keep blowing my mind. You're like, my gosh. There are so many moments of influence and compromise in our lives. So many. The day we live in right now of what's possible is crazy. So I know it's hard, so I'm not making light of this. I, what I, maybe, what, maybe my example is not the best. I guess the way I'm looking at it is, and I, I love running water. Don't get me wrong. Nothing better than a good toilet, all right? But... I do dream about the idea of just living in a cabin in 1850. 
where I had my gun <laughs> and I had my little plot of lands and I went and got my squirrel for that dinner that night and then I went out into the garden and picked a few vegetables and I got my little family and we're doing great. Now, I know it wasn't as easy as that. I just let, read, I played a lot of Oregon Trail. We all know what happens. <laughs> but there is that thought. 1850 is what it is. But I, I think about the renewing of our mind, of all these statistics, of the things that come in. I mean, I'm sitting around a table. I don't ever remember doing this with my father, but sitting around the table eating breakfast in the morning, I think our conversations, I'm looking at my father in the back, I think our conversations were really stupid. I mean, I really do. Now my children are like, did you know? Did you know? Because why? Because they have their phones. Did you know this? Did you know that? Did you know that they just created this? Did you know? They tell me more. Than, I don't even watch the news. They know that. I don't watch the news. So they tell me my news. They tell me everything. I have no idea what's going on in the world. But boy, my children... They're telling me everything. And I'm just blown away, again, by so much, so much. Renewing our minds is an everyday process. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I mean, can you go wrong with those groups of scriptures, I mean, I mean, that's it. I want to please God. I want to offer my body as a living sacrifice. Why? Because I don't want to conform to the pattern of this world. Yeah. By renewing my mind, what happens is I'm able to see God's perfect will. By renewing my mind daily, I'm not going left or right. I'm not in a, a moment of compromise. I use this example often, and I apologize for young ears in the room, but this is a main service. There is kids' service, by the way. I'm not judging if you kept your children in here, but just know that anything could come out of my mouth. All right, that's on you. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. All too often we see this world, it's so sexualized. Everything is. I mean, we see it. It's all around us. It's constant, constant, constant. And I, I'm... I'm not ever shocked or surprised, but it's interesting that the, the verbiage that's spoken in the world is have sex with as many people as you want, as often as you want, go out, be promiscuous, do what you want, it's your body, do it, go, have fun while you're young. I don't think I've ever came across any married couple that's married and they go, man, I wish I would have had sex with other people a lot more. I, I don't ever hear that from Christian couples. When you get married and it's a blood covenant, it's a blood covenant. It's a, it's a covenant. And when you have sex in marriage, it's the best thing you could do. It, it, it's the most beautiful thing you could do. And when you compromise outside of marriage, you're closing opportunities. Now, you'll say, well, what kind of opportunities? Actually, what you're doing is not really closing doors of opportunity. You're opening up doors of possible failings, Come on. where you've got all sorts of things. I don't know too many virgins that have STDs. I know you're, you're like, Josh, say it better. I don't know any virgins that have STDs, <laughs> right? I, when you have this, you're, when, you, when you're walking in the compromise of sex before marriage, you're opening up yourself to a world of And I know you're like, oh, he's dogmatic. No, I'm just preaching the word of God. You can get mad at me all you want, but it's the truth. And I know some of us have not been perfect. All right, I get it. All right, I do get it. That's where sin, we've compromised and sins came in. But that's why God's so beautiful in the fact that he, his mercies endure forever. Thank you, Lord, for the redemptive power of repentance. God, I'm so thankful for your mercy and your grace. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, God, that you are for us. 
period. So I'm not trying to condemn anyone in this room, all right? Condemn myself all the time. I get it. But I want us to be set free with the breastplate of righteousness that we can stand up in the front line of the enemy schemes of the battle and say, you know what? But I know who I am in Christ Jesus, and I'm going to stand for what's right. When we give ourselves over as a full whole self living sacrifice, what Romans 12, 1 through 2 is telling us, that then what happens is I'm able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So every day we must ask our children, are you renewing your mind? What's been going on? How's your life? What's God speaking to you about? That's so important. So again, teaching them that the word of God, that it is written. Secondly, to sit there and tell them, hey, you got to renew your minds. You need to focus on the word of God. There are three things that we should do within the focus of renewing our mind, and that's teaching our children. The prep work here is to say to them, hey, there's some expectations, and set these correctly with your children, that when your child opens up the Bible, what they should expect. You should teach them that it's not just a bunch of words Okay, you teach them, you say, hey, when you open up the word of God, what's happening is, is you're looking to see the character of God. What is he doing? What is he saying? And what he's trying to get your attention on and how you can appropriate it in your own life. That's, that's the expectation. So that prepping with the word of God to your children to say, when you read, this is what you're looking for. Not just read some Proverbs, read some Psalm, just read it, all right? No, where is God at in it? So you begin to ask him these questions, giving them the proper perspective that the Bible says you and I are about to live forever. Okay, so in living forever, we have a unique opportunity that day-to-day things that will last into eternity. So with that perspective, asking them the question, what do you think we could do today that would last forever? So it's talking to them that when they're reading, what can we do today? How can we apply this in our life? What, what did you learn? How, what's happening in your life right now that you could put the word of God into practice? Asking me these questions. And then the third thing is personal time. I think it's important that we encourage and don't nag all right, your child to commit to a specific time every day to read the word of God. It's not nagging, it's encouraging. I know people who are like, I don't make my children read in the Word. I don't make them do these things because that's what my parents did, and I ran from the church. Okay, I'm I'm not criticizing your parents, but maybe their method wasn't correct, all right? But that doesn't mean that this isn't correct, because that's the problem. It's that notion of like, yeah, they made me read this. (laughs) No. Okay, maybe their method was wrong. See, there's a lot of things that we do the method-wise is off, and we need to, again, align ourselves with the Word of God. When you encourage your children, maybe you go in there and say, hey, have you read your Bible today? And they go, nah, I haven't. Instead of being like, you need to read it. (laughs) No, you say, hey, how about you and I? Let me share with you what I read today in the Word of God. Okay, invite them into your world. All right, invite them in to your relationship, and ask them regularly, hey, what's God been speaking to you about? Talk to them. Don't nag. You should not use the word of God as punishment. You should never use the word of God. My child, they did these things wrong. I'm going to make them write down the whole book of Psalm. That's crazy. We all, come on. That doesn't make sense. I mean, they'll know it, but it doesn't make sense, right? (laughs) That's why in Psalm 91.1, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty. Guys, don't you all want your children to remain stable and fixed? Man, I want, I want firm foundation children. Man, I want them to be stable and fixed. You know, we, we as Christians, we have discipline. We have self-control and we have patience. We've been given children that have a seed of discipline, self-control, and patience. It's our job to develop them in that seed, to cultivate it, to bring it out. We're trying to bring good 
godly children into the next generation. It's up to us. You can't just rely on Sunday morning, the children's church worker, and that's their job, and hopefully they do a good job at it. No, it's your job every single day. We have to stop saying, I wish I had self-control. I wish I had patience. We ourselves need to have self-control and patience, and we need to be showing this within our children's lives as well. All right. So it's not enough for us just to walk around and say, I wish. It's actually putting this in practice in our own everyday lives so that why? So that we can be the example for our children to follow. All right. So in that confession, we're confessing that we have this fruit in our lives, that we are disciplined, that we are self-controlled, that we do have patience. Now, let me say this real quickly. When I use the word confession, too often people skew it and they have this notion that I'm talking about some incantation, that we use Jesus' name in some type of a magical form. That's why in Acts chapter 8, the sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer, he got it all wrong and he didn't understand what he was doing. He's a moron, okay? If you read the story, you'll go, man, this guy is so worldly, he doesn't even get it. The disciples are trying to say, this is not what it's about. Your, Your ways are wicked, When your ways are righteous, when your ways are according to the word of God, when you are using the word of God as a confession to recognize, hey, my God says who I am. My God says what my circumstance should be. My God says that if I have faith, that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. Therefore, when you're confessing, you're building up your spirit man inside, and you're just declaring what God's already declared over you. And you're telling the flesh to stop worrying, to stop looking at the circumstance and allowing that to dictate how your actions are going to be. You're saying, I'm going to confess the word of God of how it is in my life. You're not saying some magical spell as a Christian, okay? That's where people are getting it all wrong. They think Christians are kooky when we say a word confession. I'm not saying confession brings upon, you know, it's not some magical thing. What I'm saying is you're speaking the word of God of what it says on your circumstance and you're believing it because the word of God says it. Let me, let me say this. The creator, I believe in the creator. He created things. There's a, there's a perfect picture If I created the wrench, let's say I'm I'm the one who created the wrench and I come in and I see Stephen has a wrench in his hand. He's put his finger in the hole and he's sitting here and he's spinning it. And then, it's a socket wrench, by the way. So he's sitting here, he's spinning it and all of a sudden it spins off and hits him in the lip and he's like, ah, and he gets all mad at the, the, you know, the socket. And then he gets mad at the creator. Why did the creator make it like this? And it's like, yeah, but you were using it wrong. Put your finger in the hole and you're spinning it around. Then if I come in and I see Colton here, and Colton's taking the wrench and he's beating a a nail into the ground, and it flies off the nail and it hits the wood beside and it damages the wood, and he's like, oh, oh," and he's all mad because it damaged the wood off to the side. But, But Colton, that's not how a wrench is supposed to be used. But then if I take Josh and I go, Josh, here, here's a nut and here's a wrench, look, and you, Josh is like, oh. It fits perfect in there. And look, it does this. And you're like, yes, what is it meant for? And you're like, this is a great. It's perfect. And then you go, wow. This is what the word of God does for us. Yeah. That it puts us in a place, in a posture, in a position where we go, I'm in the right spot. God knows I'm, I'm being used in the right way. I'm perfect. I, I got this. God's, God's in control. There's a manual to do this. Why not follow it? That's what I'm telling you. The confession is the, is the manual to go, this is how I should be operating. So I'm telling myself how to operate. I am not defeated. I am victorious. Right? I, I have everything I need. I can ask my God anything. When I come into any type of trial or tribulation, guess what? I can call upon the Lord. I can count it all joy. I can be excited. That's completely against what the word or what the world tells us. The world tells us to be defeated. How are you? Why are you so happy? Oh my gosh. Philippians 4:13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Galatians 5:1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. And then do, and then do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Third point. 
Prayer, intercession, discernment. Through spiritual warfare, you need to teach your children discernment. You need to show them what that looks like. You need to give them examples. When you're out in public and you're able to show them in public some examples of discernment, of, hey, don't go over there, don't go over here, and you feel that, that's the word of God. That's the, the Holy Spirit telling you, mm -mm, I don't need to be here. I need to leave. These are moments for us to grow. And so in showing them out loud on all occasions, we know in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. We need to be alert. We need to be praying all the time, on all occasions, all kinds of prayers and requests, talking to our Lord in constant intercession, constantly saying, Lord, here I am. James chapter 4, verse 7 through 8, it says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is so important. I wrote this down, and I want to read it because... It, it was Holy Spirit, it, I mean, to me, I can't, I can't memorize this. And it's, to me, it's Holy Spirit inspired. And I believe that this is the truth about this entire sermon right here. When we're teaching our children about spiritual warfare, it's not teaching them how scary the devil is. Stop. Okay? Stop tr treating the devil as some, like, powerful being. Stop. Preach and teach about his ways. Frightening isn't the appearance of the devil. Rather, it's the peril of succumbing to sin under the influence of Satan. That's what we need to teach them. Instilling discernment in your children, you empower them to recognize sin and its destructive nature. Through this guidance, you're illustrating how sin can corrupt and dismantle God's intended blessing for his children. That's what we want to do. We want to guide them. We want to show them that corrupt and that horrible enemy schemes of dismantling what God has for them. Show them the opportunities. I want them to be Jesus-minded, not sin-minded. I don't want them to focus on sin, but I want them to focus on the God consciousness of things. Sin conscious gets you all trapped and, and bogged down. But when you're God conscious of the things that God has for you, so point them to the opportunities that God has for them. We teach too often of, of the sin, but, but I want you to teach on the opportunities that God has for you, the victories that he has for you. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, it says, And now, O Lord, hear their threats, and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. And then it goes on to say that then they walked out bold. They preached the word of God boldness. They asked for boldness. They received boldness. My prayer for all of us this morning is that we walk out of here bold, not defeated, not, not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but that we stand firm on the word of God, that we show our children what true spiritual warfare is and how to attack it appropriately. Guys, Sin wants to bring you down, and God wants you to succeed, period. It's that simple. Stop creating an enemy with God. If you're being torn from your, the presence of God, when you have those moments of like, oh, I don't want to go over there and pray. I don't want to pray right now. You're succumbing to spiritual warfare. What's happening is, is that you are wounded in the battle. You're wounded. And you begin to point to the wound. I can't do anything. It's, this is this, 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 this. Get your healing. Stand up and be a, 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 be a soldier in the Lord's army. Stand up, putting on your breastplate of righteousness and begin to learn what it is to stand in the breastplate of righteousness, what it means to have the salvation helmet on, what it means to, to have the shield and the, and the sword, and what it means to have the, the, the shoes and the truth, what that means. Begin to operate in it. Begin to teach others 
This is the, this is the moment. This is the God-changing moment of your circumstance. My last story. Cademan, when he was younger in elementary school, he had this kid who was just mean, mean as snot. And Cademan would go home. He'd come home every day just upset. Kids making fun of me. Kids mean. Kids this. And I taught him spiritual warfare through this circumstance. I said, Cademan, what's the word of God say that we should do with our enemy? Let's look it up. We're supposed to heap burning hot coals of love. So no matter how many times this kid does something to you, you need to pray for him. You need to love on him any chance you get, even though that kid does not deserve it. But God's love says that really none of us deserve it. So Cademan, love on him. But Cademan, in the meantime, we're going to pray. And we prayed. And we said, Lord, correct our hearts in any way, shape, or form that we need to be corrected. But Lord, if their hearts need to be corrected, correct their hearts. Lord, we pray for a blessing of opportunity on that that young man's life. God, we pray, Lord, that you bless him over and abundance. Lord, show him your love. God, we pray right now that you remove all hindrances in Cademan's way. Lord, we thank you right now that it is done and it is finished in Jesus' name. We prayed that multiple mornings. Within that school year, that kid moved to a different school. Kate and I looked at each other and we punch danced. Praise the Lord that God hears our cry. Hears our cry. When I read the word of God, I know it to be true. Psalm 86. I love it. These are... Verse 3, be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am calling on you constantly. David, man for God's own heart, constantly. Verse 15, but you, O Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Isn't it wonderful that we have a God who treats us like this? That's what it's about. He wants you to succeed. Let's pray.